I, I thought it was funny that I almost glossed over Gen X and just ignored you guys. Right. Um, <laughs> Christian, we're used to it, man. We're like, oh, you know, we don't need to talk about Gen X. We already talked you know, about Basically, that. we talked about boomers. We right? already so kind of did the cliff. Covered them. Yeah, we, we did the cliff. We, we did the cliff notes, yeah. you know, no big deal. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's just, We it's, get the idea. We understand, Christian. This is how yeah, we yeah, yeah. Wounded and, the wounded and gruff. Whatever. Okay, we get it. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And this is a part two of a generational archetype conversation we started with our good friend and art director, media producer, Christian Rivera. He's been on the show on the last episode talking about, along with us, myself and Antonia, generations, the archetypes of generations, your generational cohort, the year you know you were born, dictates the type of people you grew up around. And informs so much about our world. We were talking about that on the last episode. If you haven't been able to listen to that or watch that, it's really great. You should go back and review that because what we're going to talk about on today's episode is going to build on those concepts. We had this long interview we decided to split into two parts. And in the second part, we're going to talk about more of the practical applications of understanding generations and generational theory. Yeah. And we hope you enjoy part two of this episode. So let's get into it. So we talked about media and communication, sure. Gen Xers, you know, cobbling stuff together, trying to make things work, trying to the fixer. I think I think Neil Howe said that Gen X is like the fixer generation. There was this one YouTube video I saw of someone explaining generational theory. He was a Gen Xer. By the end, he was like he felt this sense of purpose. Like there's this there's a uh, uh, there's a park down the street that has a broken swing. And he's like, I'm a fixer. I'm a mechanic. And like afterwards, he grabbed his tools and he went and he's like, let me go fix that. Mm. And it's such a minor example, but like we're working on a lot of inner work things to help people calibrate to live their best life, find a sense of meaning and purpose. Yeah. And that to me is like fixing, not in the sense that people are broken, whatever. (laughs) Or hacking though, or helping hack a better way. Hack a better way, you know, hacking your life, you know, uh, to find a a shortcut or a warp whistle if you're a Super Mario Brothers fan, <laughs> you know? And so I think each generation has a version of what they're preparing to do. Sure. I think for baby boomers, they're collecting resources and maybe not, not maybe these things are not happening on purpose, but they're sort of happening by proxy yep. and they will contribute. So it's the idea that boomers are hoarding resources and collecting resources based on the fact that they did have this track to get through college and, 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 you know, a lot of things were relatively, I don't want to make a value judgment here, but I'm saying like they had the opportunity to collect those resources. Straightforward. And cont- pretty straightforward. They continue to do so. But because they're so anti-establishment, because they care about the culture, they're very judgmental of millennials creating flat land all the time, thinking about a future that's kind of vague, honestly, if you really put it all on paper, like we don't really know what it is yet. Uh, I think baby boomers are holding on to the resources so that when it does come time where we need money, like as a nation, we're going to need money distributed and passed through Mm -hmm. all facets of the nation. Yeah. Baby boomers are going to say, okay, great. Yeah. We'll give you our money. We'll actually make the sacrifice because they were willing to make sacrifices for their parents, their GI parents. Mm -hmm. When they asked for it and said, kid, we, we went to war. Like boomers were like, yeah, okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the same idea. Once millennials step up, and Gen Xers step up to be a part of this coming crisis, baby boomers are going to be like, okay, great. However, we're going to exchange our money for the culture. Right. Influence. Influence. Mm -hmm. We want to set the values. Mm -hmm. So they're listening. They're watching the news. They're paying attention to what millennials are saying. They're paying attention to what Gen X is saying, which is probably why you guys care about the media so much because they're watching. Your parents are watching. Yeah. Right. And uh, what messages get communicated are going to be determined, you know, with everyone's influence, but ultimately by the people who has, who have the gold make the rules. Mm -hmm. Right. And in a sense, that's what they're trying to define is what the next high and the next bit of culture is going to look like. That's what Neil talks about in the book. Uh, So I think that's pretty interesting. Do you think that corroborates with what you're seeing? Uh, I mean, I, when I read that, I thought that that was you know, like he was talking about the hoarding of the resource and it was going to be basically asked of them to sacrifice and they'll say yes. Mm-hmm. And he also mentioned that in previous aculums, it goes back and forth whether or not it's a prophet or a nomad that ends up being one of the most influential. The, in the gray next, champion is what he calls it. The gray it. tramp. That's right. Like, um, like in the Revolutionary War. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, those were nomads. Mm-hmm. In the Revolutionary War, it was actually the nomads that ended up becoming the most influential. FDR was a nomad? 
I believe so. Yeah. yeah. During World War II. Mm -hmm. But in the Civil War, I think it was profits. Yeah. And so um, so it kind of it, it it's a, either a prophet or a nomad, mm -hmm. but uh, which, which is really fascinating. It'll be an older nomad mm -hmm. or a younger prophet, most likely. Yeah. Right. Like so right now we're like seeing in the news people like um, RFK Jr., yeah. who would be a younger prophet. Yep. Right. And it's going to be it's like it's sort of somebody in that age bracket right. that probably will be the big and they'll and they will tr they're going to trade what they have to offer for the influence. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about when you talk about the Revolutionary War here in the United States, uh, there's a generation that's like fighting and arguing and doing all the logistics, like the, the legality of it and the warring of it. Mm -hmm. But you have an older person, Benjamin Franklin, mm -hmm. on a st on a ship over in Europe making alliances with France and other mm -hmm. countries to try to shore up. And it, it really, there's a lot of, a lot of that was the hero that was unspoken. Like a lot of that actually made the difference. It yeah. was more of the diplomacy that was happening outside the war on the ground as an example. I think that to that, your I that think gray yeah. hero is what you're talking about. Right. It's the yeah. values. It's, it's sort of the uh, negotiation of mm -hmm. the values yeah. and the negotiation of the, mm -hmm. the big, like there's a whole section of, with FDR talking about all of the things put in place around that time period, all of the, all of the, the, you know, the declarations for lack of a better word that were put in place during that time period. A lot of change happens very quickly, but mm -hmm. permanently, permanently over the next sure. that will last over the next 80 years will happen in that short time period. Yeah. That's why like, there's a lot of questions of like, why didn't a lot of changes happen after nine 11? We weren't necessarily primed for that. People weren't in the right positions to make those roles, to make those things happen. Yeah. Whereas this coming crisis, it's like, we're going to be making the changes we need to make. We're going to be willing to make those changes we need to make or keep things in place that we need to keep in place. And it's all going to happen like super fast, very fast. So fast. Okay. So let's find some, let's find, I mean, you're on a run right now. I don't want to dis distract, mm -hmm. but I want to come back to like access points for generations. So before yeah. we move on to the next one, can we talk about boomers for sure. a second? Yeah. So I think the generation above them, the, the old, the older artist archetypes, mm -hmm. This is our silent generation represented of people over the age of like 78, 80. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, <laughs> there's not much action access for them. We have some wisdom to gain, but the generation will like, it's going to, it's going to complete soon either through retirement or pa passing, like literally right. death right. will make that generation complete. Yep. And so I don't know if there's a lot of action except tie up loose ends, make sure you spend time with your grandkids you know, retire well, end your life well, I think is really what somebody- The that, action is kind of a letting go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so, 80, 86, 87, what else can you do, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I'm going to face that in my own life someday. And uh, he talks about how those um, the artist generation brings friendliness and warmth. Yeah. And so um, one thing that I think that a person of the silent generation can bring is, like you said, spend time with your grandkids, spend time with your families, be mm -hmm. warm, mm -hmm. like provide a warmth and a hearth-like feeling because you went through a crisis as a child, you lived through the secular crisis when you were a kid, yeah. and they might need some of that strength and op, you know, like the, the the ability to get through, yeah, and understand how like mm -hmm. we we can do this, yeah. Like I can think of a guy, a, a person, man or woman, you know, eighty five year old person in London. Mm -hmm. Hey, I had to wear masks when I was a kid, yeah, was because of <laughs> gas attacks from the Germans right. bombing us. I remember yeah. in like nineteen forty three having to wear a gas mask. You know, I yeah, know right. what it's like. It's it sucks, mm -hmm. right, to the kids yeah. that are younger now, right. So that generation, I don't know if there's a lot of access point, but I would say the the boomers, the profit archetype generation of boomers. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little about what the access point is there. What I see from boomers is kind of that hoarding of resource, but also really hoping, really hoping that the coming crisis can just be avoided, like it won't mm -hmm. actually happen. Yeah. Like maybe if we could just get the values in place enough, like if we yes. can just, you know, a conservative, you know, maybe a Christian conservative, I say, if we just bring the nation back to God, we don't have to go through the crisis. Or maybe right. somebody else, that older boomer would say, we only get the progressive values in, then we won't have the crisis. Like whatever their right. prophetic answer we just is. just get socialism in. Or yeah, we whatever, just, yeah, whatever yeah. Christianity in, or whatever, yeah. communism, whatever their, you know, menu of choices on yeah. all sides of their perspectives. Because yeah. it's more the energy of the prophet, not the specific topic. Yep. Yeah. It feels like that's really what they think is going to be the solution. And it seems like, like uh, finding more opportunities to almost like gather around the table with other perspectives and get a well-rounded vision of what like future culture could actually look like and not just like a one-sided perspective of it. Go back to media though. The problem is like, it's really hard to get my parents to come off of the cable news channels. They're better than most, but get them on X. Yep. 
formerly known as Twitter, uh, or get them on, you know, get them on another format where like real, like we can get real more quicker, you know, citizen journalism type stuff. They're still yeah. in legacy media frameworks, even though they don't have an actual cable subscription. Yeah. They're still going to their cable channels on their apps and things to watch it. Traditional and I, media and it matters to them. And like I think there's a, there, I, I think I suspect there's a little bit of an underlying, like Gen X won't admit this, but I think there's an underlying, underlying motivation there for having influence in yeah. the media. Yes. Because there is a care about the, the truth. There's a care about communicating ideas that are full, yeah. for lack of a better word, like complete thoughts. Won't, what, what, won't, what won't Gen X admit? That, that, uh, we that, like that potentially media. part of the motivation is so that the boomers will see something of higher quality or oh, higher see. value oh, that's not so one-sided. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely, I think extras on TV right now that are like in the hosting positions mm -hmm. right. are trying to kind of bring the ethos, but they're limited by the frameworks they're in. Right. I think literally right now, if we were to stop everything and say, okay, boomers define the values, like we're not there yet. Yeah. Like it would be a one side versus the other side, mm -hmm. not really an integration. Yeah. Right. Because we haven't hit the crisis that brings us all we together. We haven't hit the constellation that brings it all together, mm -hmm. that brings everything to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's been this casting forward uh, of that since they were kids. Like I, my wife, Molly, showed me a clip of kids in 1966 talking about like what the year 2000 is going to look like. Most of the answers were relative to nuclear war. Mm -hmm. As much as the high created an opportunity for them to roam free and have fun and play and do anything they wanted, you also had a lot of time to think and yeah. a lot of time to absorb all of the, the underneath stuff of yeah. the fears of nuclear war and what the future is going to look like. So there's a lot of concern about what all of it's going to amount to, which is why they care about the values so much, because it's mm -hmm. like, if we dial in the values right now, it just happens to be one side or the other side. Yeah. But if we dial in the values, we can get our act together and we can actually have a, view, a future that's better than nuclear war or, or, you know, and I think Neil House said something like uh, if there, there's a asteroid that's coming in 2029, that's going to get pretty close. It's not going to hit, but there's like this, almost this underlying desire from some baby boomers to like, I kind of want it to hit. Right. <laughs> and I kind of just want to watch it burn. Right. There's like almost like the manifesting of mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like when you have a fear and you kind of want the fear to manifest so you could say, I told you. Deal with it. Yeah. Or get over it. Or get over mm -hmm. it. Or like it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Well, even how talks about how the next saculum could be, it could be nuclear war. And I'm like, that's so, it's so interesting that he as a baby boomer is still like. That still leaks in there. It still leaks in there. Even uh -huh. though he's seeing this as a meta perspective, he's still like, and it could be nuclear war. <laughs> right, right. And I'm like, well, it's yeah. more likely to be a bunch so of other that, stuff. But And maybe. I learned that basically that there's a lot more fear driving it than I realized. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more fear of boomers from boomers from boomers mm -hmm. driving yeah. their perception of what things are going to amount to and what they're going to look like to the point where like you can almost you can almost uh, uh, you can almost conflate like a spiritual connection with with dissociation mm -hmm. of the fear. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. So I think that's what I'm seeing for baby boomers like hoarding the resources like it's almost like creating a bunker for themselves because they believe that they still believe that a nuclear war is going to break out, which I mean, I don't know if yeah. it will or not. Yeah. So, yeah that yeah. makes sense. Okay. So I guess an action step for boomers then like I keep encouraging my parents, like don't just watch legacy media. Yeah. And, and my parents are different because they're very counterculture in their own way, more traditional counterculture because they're not, they're not progressive. They're more, they kind of go more conservative counterculture, but they're still countercultural in that fashion. Yeah. But they, but like, and they're starting to like come on to X and like look at more new media and stuff. And I yeah. share things with them, you know, like texting and stuff mm -hmm. um, to try to encourage them to look at this clip, look at this video. Because they have like, they're very, it's like a very, like the messaging is kind of like from a distance. It's like you're observing and watching it. And like yeah. Gen X media to me and in millennial media is like way more hands on, like boots on the ground. You're like We're looking in the dirt, at the actual yeah. thing. So I guess the access point, I would say one of the actions or access points is get a little bit more familiar and comfortable with things that are outside of legacy media. Get mm -hmm. your sources of information from other places. Now, everybody's going to tell you that's bad and wrong. You're following misinformation and you're, you know, not hearing the truth, but like, I mean, come on, do we really believe the cable news channels that are, well, it's, it's been pretty much proven they're driven by the government and CIA and stuff like that. They have the, the right end of it all. Come on. 
Like, it's really, it really feels commiserate to me to the growth path of someone who's using introverted intuition Yeah, from like a young age that you could develop a lot of paranoia or if it's mm -hmm. lower down in the car model, you could develop a lot of paranoia about what the future is going to look like and have a lot of uncertainty there. But really the growth there is getting more perspectives, like not just, not just under, not just relying on yep. your own vision of what the nuclear war or what the future is going to look like, but getting other perspectives of how things are starting to unfold and what reality looks like. Mm -hmm. And then from there, once it's time to set those values, you are someone that can actually be pretty well informed to know where you're going to invest your money and how you're going to invest that money and know that your the cultural val values are going to be honored going forward. Yeah. yeah. So I think we can move on to talking about millennials because we talked about Gen X a little bit here and those two, the, there's a little bit of hand in hand, like with Gen X kind of being in the middle here, it feels like Gen X just kind of ekes into all of it. Um, but I think with millennials, as we start to kind of bring this home. Yeah. Well, I would uh, just say, I will apologize there. I think Gen X, the action step is, oh, yeah. we have to be willing to step into leadership. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like we're still avoidant of stepping up in a leadership fashion, I think, in a lot of ways. Just mm -hmm. want to go do it on our own. I'm yeah. going to start my tech company. I'll go do my thing. I'll go be a libertarian and live on a seasteading island somewhere in the ocean and just watch the world burn. Like, And not isolating. Yeah, Not we isolating. tend to isolate. We tend to go, all right, fine, I'll go off the grid. Or all assume that. that being ignored means that we can ignore everybody else. And right. I think the other thing is that it's uh, when I learned that Gen X is a winner take all generation, which is like some of us are going to do really well and some of us are going to do really poorly. Yeah. Um, and it's a bit doggy dog. Uh, um, the thing that came up for me with Gen Xers is that there's a percentage of us that feel very disempowered. Things did not go the way that we had hoped they would go. Yeah. As opposed to generations after us that believed that we were promised something. We didn't think we were promised anything. Yeah. We just thought that there was a track. Yeah. Well, and Or it went exactly how we expected it to go. Or yeah. I had a negative view when I was younger. And it, yeah. what did I expect? It what did exactly I expect? Exactly what I expected to go. Exactly. I had a lot of right. answers there too. And right. so there's like a disempowered feeling, but we're also a feisty generation at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this is like, I think a lot of, not all of them, but like that concept of like the middle-aged woman who's like, you know, like mm -hmm. barking at the boys, you know, skateboarding or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we really, I think we need to attend to whatever feels disempowered inside of us. Yeah. We need to attend to the thing that makes us feel like shrugging and giving up. And I guess that's everybody else's problem. Like if we can address some of that stuff, because what ends up happening is our generation overcompensates by just being like gruff and aggressive and, you know what I mean? Like, like unfriendly and... Yeah. You know, just like whatever, kind of the the older person version of whatever we were when we were teenagers, the slackers, right? That even <laughs> though we weren't slackers, right? Yeah. But um, like whatever that is, I think we need to like get some of that because it's the what's underneath it isn't actually anger. I think it's hurt. Yeah, I think I think Gen Xers are very hurt, mm -hmm. and if we can attend to some of that wounding, attend like maybe heal some of that hurt. Yeah. I think we can that we can bring that feistiness and that practicality with a bit of personal empowerment. Mm -hmm. I think that is the cocktail of a lot of leadership. So I think maybe doing like like preparing ourselves for this time period that's going to ask a lot of us too, by not feeling like everybody like well why should I do that everybody's going to ignore it if I do it anyway right like if I like okay say I step up and help a bunch of people nobody's going to care I'm not going to get any fanfare nobody's going to like. Every, nobody's going to appreciate it. Right. Like we kind of have to get over that, yeah. that part. Yeah. Getting over that's interesting. I, I thought it was funny that I almost glossed over Gen X and just ignored you guys. Right. Um, <laughs> Christian, we're used to it, man. We're like, well, you know, we don't need to talk about Gen X. We already talked you know, about that. Basically, them. we talked about boomers. We right? already so kind of basically the covered them. Yeah, we, we did the cliff. We them. did the cliff notes, yeah. you know, no big deal. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's just, we it's, get the idea. We understand, Christian. This is how yeah, we yeah, yeah. Our wounded, lives. And, for the wounded and gruff. Okay, we get it. Um, no, but the, <laughs> what do you do with them? <laughs> makes me just isolate them and manage them. It makes me think of there's this, I've been into wrestling last few years like i watched it a lot when i was a kid and i just like kind of re got into it i was just imagining like i've been in wrestling I've like been i just in like body slamming yeah, people well, and... that would be a lot of fun actually <laughs> but um there is this uh documentary series on apple tv plus called monster factory yeah and it's this gen xer who was wanting to be a wrestler who basically got his career cut short for like a back injury or something like that and he took over this wrestling academy and turned his hurt essentially into his motivation 
for helping young wrestlers to get into the major companies, to get through the indies, like to do all the gritty, gruff stuff. And he's like a tough dude. He's pushing everyone through. But throughout it, he's talking about like, it's essentially like, I can't do it anymore. And I literally can't. And it doesn't like his core is like, I don't want people to get hurt because yeah. I don't want them to experience what I experience. And, you know, Gen X, like the relationship to Gen X and their kids is like, I don't want my kids to have the same upbringing that I had. I don't want them to be without stuff or to be without attention or to have to push harder than they absolutely need to. Like they're like, that's what we naturally try to pass down. And I think there is sometimes a parent child relationship, but sometimes it's a mentor mentee relationship of, look, we had it tough, but it doesn't always have to be that tough. And I think that's part of the letting go is like not just telling people deal with it yourself and tough it out. There yeah. are point there. Are, there's the purpose to that, but not all the time of in terms of perpetuating your own abandonment. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and let me see if this lands with you as a, you know, you're older millennial, but let me yeah. tune into this from my standpoint as a leader, like as a, wanting to be a leader and helping maybe the next generation of millennials. Yeah guidance, leadership, and all that, I'm noticing that my direct command and control style of like, all right, we're going to do this. And everybody, you're going to do that. You're going to do that. You're going to like, I mean, millennials can rise to that. Mm -hmm. It's worked, but I've noticed that like, if I can bring like a cohort of millennials together and then focus them as a group onto a project, like yeah, we have a problem. We did this this past week, like a couple of days ago, I brought a bunch of people together, like mostly millennials, except for you and me, right, Antonia? Everybody's mm -hmm. at least a millennial. We're mm -hmm. talking brainstorming some it's of the ideas general, yeah. for problem solving some of the issues at Personality Hacker and some of the ways we want to go. Like both problem solving, like just logistical things of like some of the programs we want to do, more live podcasts, like maybe a membership program, stuff like that. Yeah. And I noticed like bringing the energies together and then kind of keeping focused. It's like the collaboration starts to unlock. Mm -hmm. It's almost like millennials want to work together to solve problems. Yeah, you guys love that. <laughs> yeah, from, we do. From a leadership we do. standpoint. Is that, is that resonating? Especially is that kind of what... when it clicks in like gratitude and contribution. When that's there's what something you want. that's when it's something that I feel very aligned with. Yeah. When it's something I really care about, when it's something that I feel like not only I can contribute to in terms of like my actual skill set, uh, what I've been thinking about, what's interesting to me. That's the NT side. It's like what's interesting to me. Yeah. Um, it, it really allows for me to click in and it's almost like the motivation unlocks as a result of that. Yeah. If it's just generally or for myself, like it feels like the motivation is not quite there. And I can only speak to myself, but I've seen that in other millennials. It's like once they click into something and they click into like a, a place that they care about or there's leadership or there's uh, a path or a yeah. value set where there's just like something that we're doing, suddenly the motivation unlocks. Suddenly there's this, this, there's this like almost latent yeah. capacity that just awakens and it's just like go forth and conquer kind of energy. So then what's the like? Like energetically, if we're speaking to Gen, Gen Xers now that want to step into more leadership, is mm -hmm. it focus on inspiration, focus on like function and specifics, focus on coalition? Like how, I mean, there's all these things are important, but if yeah. we had to like speak to Gen X leadership and say, here's the type of energy you want to lean more into. Right. I, I think I heard in what you said, inspiration is important. They need to feel mm -hmm. inspired or something bigger than themselves. It's kind of like with the boomers needing to grow almost like their collective introverted intuition. I think Gen X needs to grow their, in, their introverted feeling. Okay. And it's less about what necessarily I want, though that's part of it. It's less about doing the extroverted thinking effectiveness stuff and more about like, why are we doing this stuff? What is the motivation? Like you're saying motivation, inspiration, and connecting it to the practical and connecting it to the visionary, connecting it to the potential of what we could do. As, and it's, it's not like doing grand speeches of like what we can be and stuff like that, but it's like. Well, I saw your motivation get unlocked in this meeting two days ago. Yeah. Like we're in there and I could see you like as I'm talking and we're kind of idea generating, we got different people talking from all different perspectives. I could feel you coming online more and more like, well, you're already interested because you're there. Yep. But you're like, I could feel your heart activating. Like you care, like, mm -hmm. you know, you always cared, but in like, it's like, I, this is important. Like you got really excited. You were mm -hmm. lighting up. What was doing that? What was the energy that you were picking up on personally? Well, I just went through personality life path as a student. Okay. And through that, I connected with other students. There are people that I've been through programs with before gotcha. as well. So I think without even realizing it, like there is the, 
the collective aspect of having gone through that with other people you and know, with like other and people trust. I know and I know like and trust and gotcha. work through my personal stuff. Um, still working through, but like work through the bulk of it, and I feel a greater sense of contribution of like wanting to get people through that to help them uh, find their sense of purpose and focus. You know, I think also through the guidance of 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 you guys, especially you, Joel, like like really bringing your your personal motivations into what you're doing here has allowed me to think about my personal motivations. Like there's a sense of authority challenge that a lot of millennials have with self-authority. And I think Gen Xers can really encourage that self-authority. I don't think Gen Xers have a problem with self-authority. No. Yeah, that's why we're feisty. Yeah. Like millennials and we don't get along with each other. Like, no, it's my way. Yeah. There's there's <laughs> this again, I'm talking about that like that yeah. sensitivity and resilience. There's that dichotomy there of like really feeling like uh I, I need access to my own inner authority and motivation. And because that's so naturally embedded in Gen X, it's like give us a little bit of that. What does that look like? What does that mean? Break that down, you know? Mm -hmm. And some of it, sometimes it's intellectually, sometimes it's through motivation and it's letting go through letting go of some of our, our traumas and letting go of those things that we don't need to cling to all the time as an identity that our identity is bigger than that. And so for me, I'm, that feels like the path I'm working through is that like my identity is not my trauma and my stories and uh, those narratives that I'm clinging to, to try to almost like get someone to take care of me, but like yeah. I can step in, I can step up. And with our team, it's like, I have more, I feel a sense of authority. I feel a sense of ownership of my role, which is like creativity, creative director, you know, producing, being, bringing content to the table. And I, I feel more connected to, you know, self, like a self motivation, self propelled self 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 okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know well, yeah is that a way to now unlock maybe some of the action steps for millennials like if we could talk about from a millennial perspective yeah you probably have some heuristic you're using of what type of leadership you'll fall fall in with or the type of groups of people you're like going to associate either it's association or followership it's yeah. both are in some ways but how maybe that's the access point for millennials is like which i think a lot of millennials are like who do i listen to yeah. And they default to mom and dad often, yep. quite frankly, from mm -hmm. my perspective, mm -hmm. like whatever mom and dad's viewpoint is. And again, I'm not trying to offend well, millennials, some, but that's just what I see. I Well, and sometimes carry out the values that yes. they're the one-sided values of the boomers who are watching legacy media yeah. and carrying it down yeah. or getting defaulting to pot politics and stuff like that. Uh, uh, and, and not actually thinking about what are my individual values? What do I care about? And by proxy, what am I looking for in a leader and in what they care about? You know, I work with you guys because we're doing good work here. Like, it's not only just the skill development. Like, I've taken the time to develop my own skills. I could do that. I don't need someone to just teach me skills. I need someone who is is bringing, like, a, a bigger picture vision to the table that is actually, like, achievable, that is tangible, that brings it down to earth. Because, like, there's almost too much abstraction and almost too much... Uh, and, and with my millenn fellow millennials and myself included, when you think about politics, you think about the big picture, you think about things like nuclear war or those big picture possibilities. It's too open. It's too big. It's too vague. Saving the world is like, what does that even mean? Even things like global warming, what does that actually tangibly mean? What are the systems effects of those things? Like, what are the projects that, that Gen Xers are leading or getting a, in, involved in that are uh, a cog in the node of the system of those things that I can actually contribute to and be a part of. And millennials at scale, when they, the constellation alignment for them is like almost locking into what those values are yeah. and finding those Gen X leaders that are going to give them direction, give them purpose and skill build in the process to like, galvanize is the word that comes to mind yeah and maybe some peppering some life experience in there too because Gen yes. Xers are going to have they w they were they're in midlife now mm -hmm. so there's a bunch of experience they have millennials then are there other avenues from your perspective antonia maybe other avenues for millennials to lean more into their energy as far as how like how do you see if you could offer from a gen x perspective you're looking at millennials i mean we talked about i guess the thing i would encapsulate to say is if you're a millennial listening or watching right now Pick better leadership, like tune into better groups of people, tune into better, like 
or I wish it better. Better is bad because it gives a quality of just well, be judicious. Defaulting. Be judicious about who you are tuned into. And it yeah. could be mom and dad. Mm-hmm. It could be the person that you're like associated with now or the way you're framed at right now. But I think well, maybe just tune into it at all. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess the other thing I mm-hmm. see is like I'll go on YouTube and I'll see groups of people under the age of 23. It kind of an environment like this, all sitting at like a giant couch situation. Yeah. No single person there has ever been married or has children in this environment. And they're talking like with authority, like how relationships and right. like long-term relationships and like male-female dynamics work. And I'm like, you're all like, your brains haven't even started, stopped forming from like right. a biological stance until 25. How do you, you've never been in a long-term relationship. How long right. could it have been? You're 23. Like, I right. don't understand how you could have. It's like you're just reciting stuff from and, psychology books. And I'm not being critical of it. I think that what I see in that is like, oh my God, what a bunch of people, like what, what an amazing group of people that are eager to share and collaborate and understand things and unpack things. Mm-hmm. But I feel like if I were to come and say, hey, can I kind of be part of it and help give some, per- no, we don't want, like, I, f- I don't think this has ever been stated. Yeah. But it feels like, no, we don't want any bad old thinking here. We right. want the fresher, better thinking because it's newer and we really know what's going on. Right. I don't think that's the message actually being given out, but that's the impression from somebody on the outside that looks at it goes, okay, I don't think that's the leadership energy is not wanted here. They yeah. want to be kind of left to figure it out on their own. I see that. And too. I know I'm broad brushing a lot here, but you get the point. Yeah, I know what you're saying. My observation of millennials is, and this this might even go back to the sort of the the like a generational archetypal assumption that because the hero generation is waiting for the crisis, they're waiting for things to almost be like rubble, right? Like quote unquote uh, destruction. Yeah, is is that that's what they're designed? They're designed to be strong. As an arch- as a as a generation, as a heroic generation, they're designed to anticipate destruction and rise to the occasion in it. As and a collective. Th- as a collective, right? Yeah. It's like it's when the crisis hits that they know what their purpose was. Mm-hmm. And so what I see is in preparation for that and in preparation for like whatever is the the old way to be complete and entering the new place, new way. The crisis isn't quite here yet. So what I see is a lot of The word is deconstruction and you'll see this in a lot of faith, you know, like people who are like leaving faith traditions or, or, or redefining their relationship to it. They they talk about deconstructing things. I see this with, you know, the, the, also the concept of like, what is normal, you know, what is, um, you know, neurotypical versus mm-hmm. neurodivergent, right? Mm-hmm. And they're deconstructing this idea of what like normal is. Right. And, uh, and there's a deconstruction of like the relationship to faith. Mm-hmm. And deconstruction is not the same as destruction, but there's almost the sense that if I put it down to its components and I kind of just dest- like, quote unquote, destroy what was once there, yeah. somehow purpose will arise from it. Somehow mm-hmm. I'll understand, I'll have greater clarity. I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll know what the next piece is. And unfortunately, what I see is a lot of that. It almost feels like busy work to make lateral moves, mm. right? It's like I deconstructed my faith and now I'm in like one that's, like I'm just as attached to you move into like a secular faith almost. Yeah. And there's now a secular faith. Like, mm-hmm. and what are the ready-made secular faiths for me? Right. Mm-hmm. Like I'm out of my religion, but now I'm into like, whatever is this, re- like, like this activist mind frame or this, mm-hmm. you know, like, or whatever it's like, and then I'm going to, I'm going to act just as faithful to that the, as I did in my religion because, right. because I, I, I deconstructed it and the deconstruction all by itself is supposed to tell me, what clarity and what enlightenment is. It was all about the energy all, all along, not the narrative. They deconstruct one narrative and pick up another because it's the energy they're connecting it to. The right. energy that's carrying underneath it. Right. Right. And of the religious fervor or the buy in yeah. or the whatever mm-hmm. that Pick- they pushed away narratively. Well, I still feel that energy. So I'll grab another narrative and apply it to the same energy. Right. Because what the I hear you say. heroic energy is still there. The heroic energy of being a part of something bigger and wanting to be strong for whatever's coming next and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Like mm-hmm. the fervor is still there. Yep. It's just now it's pointed in a slightly different direction. And, uh, and when I hear you saying like, be smart about who you're choosing next, right? Like what, like be smart about what you're going to. I would also say be smart about not just making a bunch of lateral moves, yeah. you know, it's like, and like you said, it, it almost feels like in a desire to not have any of the old thinking, that's part of the deconstruction. Mm-hmm. In a desire to not have the old thinking, there's this sense of um, if it's fresh and new and nobody's been thinking it for as long as I've been aware of history, 
then it must be good. It must be the new way. And it's like, there's a lot of problems in there too. You're just waiting for them to manifest. Not just good, better. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Not just good, but better than the old way. Yeah, Yeah. it's better. And it's like, maybe, (laughs) maybe it's better. Right. (laughs) Or maybe there's just a bunch of problems waiting for you at the end of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. One of the key components of, of integral theory, which is like spiral dynamics, Graves model, that kind of stuff. When you're moving through levels of development, it's the idea of transcend and include. Right. And what is happening a lot is people are trying to deconstruct and they're trying to move into something else that feels like more of a, a a new community that's being formed, Mm -hmm. not around the old values, but kind of not realizing that religions and church and civility are areas of natural human development that Mm -hmm. we need some aspects of it. We need to experience what like a church provides, for example, like community, communing like once a week at minimum together, having a connection, talking about issues or challenges or like contributing to the community or uh, experiencing a sense of awe and wonder, you know, playing music together, artistic expression. Are you saying that for my membership pitch? A little bit. Yeah. (laughs) I'm kind of doing that, but like, that's actually what it honestly teasing, is, is yeah. attempting to provide. Yeah. Like we're doing that at our studio space. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's not religious in its uh, uh, treatment and its decor, but it's an opportunity for people to show up on a regular cadence, yeah. something that they can trust that they can go to and, and have those conversations about something or express themselves poetically or musically mm-hmm. have a sense of awe and wonder or ha- like my wife gave like a creative sermon, essentially mm-hmm. talking about creativity and expression. And she came alive and she came from an evangelical background. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. the perfect example of this. Mm-hmm. I came from more of an atheistic bra- background, but she came through that. She just came alive on stage. And there is, there is a certain uh, sense of purpose that comes through being connected to that sort of community element. It's just now extracting. And like you said, becoming aware mm-hmm. of what you're, what you're trying to leave behind and what you're still getting by accident Mm -hmm. and almost starting to learn what are the core pieces of that and getting that on purpose instead. Yeah. And that made me think of the next thing that I would recommend to millennials is um, maybe keep the scale a little smaller. You Mm -hmm. you talked about the Gen X that was like, and there's a, there's a swing that's broken out the playground. I'm going to go fix it. I'm going to pick up my tools and go. It's like, there's a, uh, the idea of having like a community, an art community that mm-hmm. you're a part of. Right. Like you don't have to be part of this huge. I mean, I, I don't, I'm trying not to say it in a way that sounds offensive, but like important conversation activist cause, right. which is part of this big abstraction of something mm-hmm. where like states are in battle with each other. And like, you it's know, a vague thing you can't personally do a lot of things about. And there's you no get upset metrics about it. to <laughs> hit. Get upset about it. Which I think is the point of it already. Yeah. yeah. It whipped up. <laughs> gets everybody whipped up. And it's like, you know, and like I, I'm, I can't visit this state because there's a governor of the state that I don't like. And that means that this thing, and yeah. it's like, Okay, well, hang tight. Maybe there's something that you can apply that energy to that isn't about a bunch of states fighting that aren't that you don't even live in. So mm-hmm. why do you even care? Right. Like, what's going on in your community? Yeah. What's happening? Like, is there a way to build some how of that coalition? To, how can we get together and rebuild a park? You yeah. got it. Exactly. Yeah. Is there maybe a way where, like, quote unquote, saving the world, which is a terrible, terrible piece of propaganda that millennials were mm-hmm. raised with? Mm-hmm which they are very reluctant to let go of. Because Well-intended, not well-intended. bad. Like, it's not a bad message, right? Well, mm-hmm. it's an archetypal energy of the entire mm-hmm. generation. You're supposed to think it's your job to save the world because yeah. some crisis is coming and you're going to have to be there for it. Yep. And in, instead of just feeling that sense and getting agitated and wanting to keep the scope super big, can you bring it down to go, well, maybe saving the world is actually like saving this one experience for this one person. Right. Right. Like mm-hmm. what is save a life, save the whole world. It's like, yep. and what is saving a life? Is it like just preventing death yep. or is it like saving the quality of somebody's life as well? Right. So can things be brought to a, a smaller scope and scale so that you can be a part of the action, feel the results, feel like that you're, you know, you're, you're fulfilling your archetypal missive Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's actually preparation for the crisis. I think we feel that. I I think we feel that with a lot of our students that come through, there's this like eagerness to contribute. It's like, I found my people, I found my place. I found 
where I want to be, or at least the energy I want to be in. Right. And it's like, how can I stay a part of this? Mm -hmm. And there's this like continued fervor to like keep a part of this. And and a lot of millennials, I think we're searching for something to attach to. Yeah. Very much so. So Gen Z is coming right behind millennials. Yeah. And these are my children, most mm -hmm. likely. Uh, they're going to identify this cohort. I think a lot of their, a lot of their lives are, I think they were introduced to a digital world before they were introduced to an analog world in some ways. Yeah. Like they've, they've kind of framed in a digital way and it's probably only gonna get more like that. Right. They, I feel like there's a bifurcation mm. as well. Cause I feel like they're one extreme or the other. They're kind of like real compliant and bought in or real rebellious and almost kind of like my generation. It probably depends on which parents raised them. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right Whether it was right. like millennial parents versus Gen X parents, probably right. Gen X parents raised more right. countercultural, damn the man, go against the system, grind, you know, grinding against the system kind of energy. I my also, children were like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think as you're talking, it's clicking to me. We were talking during personality life path. There's, there's a survival strategy that came up. I think the theme of this one was survival strategies and yeah. a lot of millennials are working through that. And uh, a lot of Gen Z, I think, are going to have to be reckoning with their own later in their life. And I think a lot of it is the autonomy and strategy, uh, survival strategy, which is yeah. they're overprotected. They don't have autonomy. And when you're experiencing autonomy, uh, a lack of autonomy sort of results to two strategies. Either you submit or you rebel. Yeah, and I think go. that's what you're seeing there you go. is there's this sort of do I submit to it or do I rebel against it? But there's still an attachment to it. Right. It's like being anti-religious or anti whatever, it still has you. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that either way, the, that autonomy survival strategy is what's clicking for me. Well, and they're not just overprotected. People do things to children right now in their own best interest, mm -hmm. which is actually in the parents' own best interest. Right. But they're doing them to their children. Right. And their children are compliant enough to go along with it. Right. Whether or not that's actually the right option or choice for them long term. Right. And I see this all over the place. And it's like Gen Z or the iGen or the Homelanders are this generation that gets the complete trickle down effect mm -hmm. from everybody's stuff. Mm -hmm. They get the cultural messages that get down to, uh, uh, to millennials who are per perpetuating their parents stuff because they don't have a place to put mm -hmm. their energy. Mm -hmm. And then like sometimes some of the, the Gen X angst mm -hmm. a little bit, like oh, it, yeah. it's, it's just a, this, this mixture of, not really knowing what to do. So there's almost like a shutdown energy mm -hmm. a little bit there. They don't have like uh, the Homelanders and the artists, the silent generation were basically being raised to be compliant so that when the generations uh, align and we go through the crisis and we rebuild the institutions, they fill those institutions, right? They are going to be compliant to whatever the values are. And then in the next saculum, when we get to the next awakening, and we start rebelling against those, the mm -hmm. silent generation, the, the next, the Gen Z's in the next, what, 40 years are suddenly going to be like, why was I compliant all that time? Things are starting to change. And still they kind of become compliant to the fact that things are changing. So mm -hmm. there's, there's this continued sort of polite generation compliance aspect to them. So mm -hmm. they're too young to really be listening to this. But I think as parents, I think there's obviously the benefit to us for them to step aside and be compliant because if we have to do things like they can't be in our grill all the time, <laughs> like yeah. that's the challenge. But I think similar to what we were talking about in the previous podcast episodes we did around this, it's like making sure that we're like expressing our gratitude for like not spoiling them in a negative way, but like, you know, our, our, our kids are giving us the time to do this, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like pay it, you know, reciprocity. Well, and while this is like a general statement to all parents and all children of all generations and all time periods, try not to put too much of your stuff on them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, like that's just a general good parenting principle. Like be aware of how much you're talking about politics around your kids. You got it. Or and stuff like that. Or how much you're talking about crisis or how much you're talking about like, you know, how the government's out to get us or how much you're talking about how all of these, all, you know, all these people are terrible, horrible because they don't believe our same political persuasion. Right. Mm -hmm. Like divide, divide, divide. Yeah. Like be careful not to impregnate your children with divisive thinking mm -hmm. that is not going to serve them when we're we're, we're all going to have to make the sacrifices we're going to have to make pretty soon. Yeah. yeah. I need to have a childhood.
They need yeah. to play. Yeah, you know, yeah. Give them time and give them the room to be creative. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of the artist generation moniker is mm -hmm. art. Art creativity comes out of restriction. Mm -hmm. Like you have specific parameters that you have to work within, or in this case, they're overprotected. And they've, you know, we believe that kids need to be out in the world and be bored that way. Mm -hmm. That's a different kind of boredom. But if you have like restrictions of like, I want to build a costume for myself and I only have what's in my house or in my room, mm -hmm. then that breeds creativity yep. as well. Yep. So I think that's just going to naturally occur uh, through that generation. Yeah. Um, but it is like making sure that they're allowed to have that world, yeah. that they're allowed to create, that they're, they have the tools, whether it's the iPad or, <laughs> the, yep. or like pencils and pens and things like that, that they can really get a, not just an overprotected, like, waiting experience but they can actually like build a skill and could express themselves and and not completely dampen the light of their experience as a person in mm -hmm. order to let their parents do the serious work yeah okay mm -hmm. so summing this up we talked about generational archetypes there's basically four generational archetypes that cycle over and over again mm -hmm. based on patterns we've seen again this is a theory a model uh, that live through different seasons of time, 20-year seasons of time. And so a generation, a 20-year roughly cohort of a generation, usually will live through different parts of their life through different seasons of, you know, conflict and all this. And I think of conflict, too, as we're thinking about conflict, it really is the death and birth of a, like of a generational cycle, of a, of a way of thinking, a way of being. It's the way, mm -hmm. like, it dies off. And then something out of that is reborn. Like I think at World War II, really what died off in World War II, it was the final nail in the coffin of colonialism. Like I think that is one thing it killed off. Like colonialism, this is what Richard Churchill was super panicked about. He was always trying to like mitigate. He knew, he, he must have had like NI or something. He just knew it was coming. He knew yeah. colonialism and he was like freaking out. Like I, it's the worst thing ever. If England doesn't have our colonial center points around the world, it's going to be really bad. We need to have those. That's what he yeah. was fighting for. Right. That didn't work out, right? Well, he, and, it, and for England anybody who's going to yeah. say, it didn't end it, there's still colonies. It's like it ended well, the I time mean, period where that was expanding. Yeah, like Hong it, Kong was handed back. And right. Like it's other, like India was like it. Colonialism yeah. started receding and it continues yeah. to recede. Uh, there's, yeah. yeah. You can make arguments for all that. But in general, please don't get specific down to like yeah. every little possible mm -hmm. dis disagreement. Mm -hmm. It's in general, though, it really did start the trajectory of colonialism not right. being, and the Civil War mm -hmm. here in the United States ended the idea of slavery. And that mm -hmm. took a long time for right. all the other things that slavery was associated with mm -hmm. to work it, and still working itself out, right? Yep. It's still having problems with it. So, yep. There's old ways of thinking that die and then new ways that are born at these total war conflict points. And so there's things that are going to die in the next one. Yep. Things will be reborn. That's really interesting. It's almost like if, if like culture was a life, it's like it dies and is reborn at a moment. Right. But we don't as people die. It, we, we're alive in both of them, so we have a different mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think that's going to be very interesting to see what's coming yeah. for us. And I think we all know it's brewing. I, mean, I don't think anybody can sit back and go, no, what, what are you talking about? There's no... There's no coming crisis brewing. Like <laughs> whether they want to admit it or not, it's like 100 percent of people on the planet are like, yeah, yeah. I can feel, yeah, I can smell coming. the wind, I can smell it in yeah. the air. And we I know it's on its way. And I think Neil Howe, you know, Neil Howe postulates about what the future could potentially look like, but is very, very specific about saying that these are patterns. It's not a prediction in terms of what's going to emerge. Yeah. Like the new world, so to speak, is just it's it's likely to be unrecognizable. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't want to spend time, you know, personally, I don't, I don't I'm not going to speculate too much about what that means, but there are things happening in the yeah. next. I think Japan is doing another World's Fair in 2025. There you go. Like we're starting to think about that stuff a little bit. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's just interesting to have this in mind and pay attention to what the next decade is going to look like. And, and I highly recommend reading the book. Yeah, for sure. And his there's a couple different things here, dates wise, that are very fascinating that he brings up. He says that this season seems to be dilated. Mm -hmm. So winter is going to extend longer than the usual 20, 25 years. Yeah. My, his guess is somewhere around maybe 2032-ish, mm -hmm. um, right? Yeah. So that's around the time period. Also, as far as like the generational dates, the reason why I also agree with you, what you said earlier, Joel, about how 
Um, I would trust their generational date breakdowns more than anything in the media or census reporting. Because census reporting is just talking about time periods of births, Mm -hmm. whereas generational theory places generational timelines based on the occurrences that are happening in the world. So take, for example, 1924 was the cutoff for what you could call like the lost generation, right? The previous um, nomads. Nomads. And then, um, oh, no, 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 excuse me. That's not accurate. It was actually 1925 started the GI. And then, no, it didn't start the GI. Ended the GI. It started it the ended artist. the GI. 1924 ended the GI, and yeah. 1925 started the Lost, which yeah. was artist. artist. Thank artist. you. My apologies. So it went from hero to artist on the 25, 20, 24, 25 split. Those you two got years, it. 1925, you got it. 24. And the point of all of that, now that I've made it, it was super confusing, <laughs> is that uh, 1924 was the last year of um, being qualified for conscription into World War II. So after that, you weren't drafted. 1925 was the first year that you were not going to be drafted for the war of World War II. You were too young. You were too young. But we didn't know that till after the war but because it could have gone for 10 years. You it got it. For four or five years in American time. And right. there was even, they quote people talking about how I was, you know, somebody, this writer was born in 1925 and he remembers wanting to be drafted. He mm-hmm. wanted to go to war for World War II, but it was like, sorry, you're just too young. And he's like, I could feel the difference of my generation, all the me and everybody who came after me versus people born in 1925, 1924 and before yeah. who were conscripted. Mm-hmm. He's like, there was just a difference. It was like those people just would look as, uh, look at us and we just didn't know something they did, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's how generational theory breaks down those time periods. And what's so interesting is that uh, he says in the book, we might not actually know when the millennial generation ends until the crisis hits. Yeah. So the millennial generation, like I've always thought that our oldest gunner, who's 17 at this time, obviously is going to be part of Gen Z. But it's entirely possible that gunner could be one of the last of the millennials, depending upon what the crisis asks of that generation. And what age bracket does it stop asking that level of sacrifice from the heroes? And so it's just a really it's like they have a different way of looking at it. The dates are different because of that. And um, and in some ways, I give it more weight. You mean I have to put thinking into this and actually look at dates and numbers? <laughs> yeah. And I can't just be like, well, you're a Gen Z because you're young. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah, I got to think about it. Yeah, and- this idea that Gen Z started in 96, I'm like, who decided that? That doesn't make any <laughs> sense at all. But yeah. Well, it's, yeah. this, it's this humility to me that we're still on the leading edge of existing. Like, mm-hmm. we're, like we have all this history that led up to today, but like we're it, baby. Like yeah. we're, we're, we're defining what's coming. We're a mm-hmm. part of what's happening. We're like, things are not going to stay the same way that they've always been. They, and they haven't. And I think we feel that now more than ever. Yeah. And we're going to definitely experience that going forward. But it's like, that's what I mean about the, the meaning crisis. It's like, it's not sitting back and waiting for it to happen. Maybe that's my hero ethos coming out, <laughs> but it's like, you know, we're, if you're paying attention naturally to yeah where your energies are going, maybe paying attention to this podcast and some of the tips that we've been giving you, like when that constellation moment comes, like you're just going to launch into action and be part of the new world and be, I mean, frankly, a part of history mm-hmm. one way or the other. Yeah. And, uh, like there's something, there's definitely like the exciting hero ethos part of me. That's like, yeah, let's go, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And it's also like, there's going to be a lot of grief that needs to be Mm -hmm. felt. There's going to be a lot of complex emotions, but ultimately I think I feel humility that like, I, I I get to be a a part of this and and I think I could find gratitude in that. Do you don't think it's a curse? May you live in interesting times? No, no, (laughs) no. I'd rather be having interesting experiences and have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think if I compare this with like the last saculum cycle, the 1920s and 30s, the nomads are inventing technology like radio. I mean, I don't know if a, a, a nomad invented it, but radio is coming on the scene broadcast. Uh, cinema had just been invented a little bit before that, but it was starting to come in its own sophistication, like with sound and mm-hmm. color. And they were getting better and better at making movies. We had, again, radio in the early days of television and telephone. It was like it started to take off. 1930s is when most of the United States was electrified. Yep. We went from an agrarian kind of you went to sleep with the with the sun, and then you now you have electric lights, which mm-hmm. skew, plus radio, and you can hear news from all over, right? Mm-hmm. The whole the whole world you're getting updates of the news immediately. Like technology was just like brewing right before the crisis. Right, you could just feel it brewing underneath the surface. Mm-hmm. I could feel that here too. We've got yep. WorldCoin, 
you know, scanning the eyes with your orb, with the orb or whatever. <laughs> and like this, this like digital world that's developing kind of on the blockchain and, and well, all that with you know, like an analog world that we still live you in. You've got the privatization of space. You've, yeah. You've got solar, you've got electric, yeah. electrified. Uh, Robot farming. Like looking stuff's coming. at bigger scale, mm -hmm. like what does, you know, electric cars at scale look like? What yes. does some of these oh. other technologies look like at scale? That yeah. when the when the time comes to click in, like what makes sense to implement? Well, and like I mean, the the advancements of nuclear, mm -hmm. right, as an energy source, yep. and the idea of maybe making it like single like single cell, right? Like, yeah. like we run our houses but, off of little pack or whatever, like, and screw, changes the game. Screwing with biology, like it was about yep. eugenics and like other things mm -hmm. back in the thirties, like right. That's true. It was like like eugenics race was and eugenics and right. screwing with biology. Now we have gain of function laboratories developing like bioweapons mm -hmm. yep. that can infect people. Like and the idea it, of messing you, with bodies to change their nature. yeah. If you just kind of look at this, it's like wow, it, it, there is a lot of pattern repeats. Mm -hmm. yep. Like you could just yep. see the pattern. If you just look yep. and you compare notes, they're different subjects, but the energy is very similar. Yep. Absolutely. So that's, again, why I think this theory makes sense to me. I'm an mm -hmm. intuitive. A lot of theories make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it feels like it's rooted in a, mm -hmm. uh, a pragmatic like view of history that yeah. really took account of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think their work is great. And I would love to have Neil Howe come and be on yeah. the show. Yeah. And I, think I we mean, if we could happen. ever get that, maybe we have to go to DC and find a way to get him closer to home. He may not come all the way up here, but uh, I would love, I think he lives in DC, maybe yeah. New York. I don't remember, but. Well, I appreciate you guys being able to like being willing to let me geek, yeah. geek out about this on yeah. camera and find that practical access point because it, first of all, it makes my hero ethos like yeah. feel really good that like people are listening and they can <laughs> calibrate something to it. And that's why I work with you guys to like, really support that. Yeah. But you know, you're both doing the work in the Gen X perspective to really step into leadership and figure out what that means, both tension muscles and release muscles. Yep. You know, and uh I don't know. I'm very optimistic as a result of all of that. Yeah, cool. me too. Well, if you've been listening along or watching along, you have not been the fourth person in this three person conversation. It's been myself, Antonia, and Christian, but we do want to hear from you. If you come over to personalityhacker.com, directly below this episode, leave a comment, ask a question, more importantly, share your story. What perspectives are coming up for you? What is your generation? How do you see your generation's role in the world and the perspective of like, what do you think it is that you and your cohort are here to contribute? What are some of the blind spots? Maybe you look at some of those other episodes we talked about last year. Christian brought a lot of this great thinking around generational shadow. Do you identify with some of that generational shadow inside of yourself or inside of your cohort of a, a generation or a constellation or however we're defining this? Come over to personalityhacker.com and make your voice heard. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave us a rating review on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. Uh, we're also on YouTube. You might be watching us right now as a video podcast. If you enjoy this episode, you can like, subscribe, and hit the bell to let you know when future episodes will be coming out. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it in all major book retailers. And if you leave us a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. And I highly recommend the next time our personality life path program opens up. We've been talking a lot about it because it's like our favorite thing to do now. And it moves the needle for so many people. It changes lives. And it's, I, I think it's about one of the best things we've ever put together. So the next time the personality life path program opens up, we highly recommend that you give a serious consideration to invest in yourself and in your growth and development to become the kind of person that's going to be ready for the next crisis, yeah. <laughs> right? Like stretch out your hammies, it's going to get real, right? And, yeah. and uh, part of how you do that is to work on yourself. Now, the best way to know about the Personality Life Path program coming out is go to personalityhacker.com, take our online assessment and get signed up to our email list. If you do that, then you can know of all the cool things that are coming up, including live podcast opportunities. We do that all over the country and uh, Personality Life Path program or profile training, all sorts of good stuff you get to find out when you sign up to our email list. So I strongly recommend you do that and keep informed. Yeah. Thanks, Christian, for being here today. My absolute pleasure. As a, as a guest co-host. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good time. Thank and, you. Uh, I would love to have you on more going forward. Maybe we'll get you down from New York and we'll do some more recording this fall. I'll and, keep thinking know. about things. Yeah, I'd love to have you on the show <laughs> more. I think you you really bring a great perspective and I like I like talking with you. My name is Joel Mark Witt. My name is Christian Rivera. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. <laughs>